Good morning. It's good to be with you again. And we are together because we are with our God. And because you and I share the same relationship with him, that ties us together wherever we may be. I thank God for that today. And that's a truth that's going to be very special as we look at our next text today, as we apply this to our lives. We're looking at the family of Abraham, their history. We're picking up, continuing with Esau and Jacob. Now, yesterday we talked about how Rebecca and Isaac had been given these two twin boys, Esau and Jacob, and how there was a discontent in the lives of both of them that caused problems. We're going to expand upon this today. And it's, it, it's a dark time, but God's love shines through, and that's what really makes it bright. But let's look at this dysfunctional family, and really that's what it is. Isaac and Rebecca, Esau and Jacob, there's a lot of problems. And there's really no sense in dancing around that. It's, it's good to recognize it, to own it. Isaac and Rebecca are two parents who show poor parenting skills and that they have favorites and they make it very obvious. Isaac loves Esau. It's his favorite. And perhaps it's because Esau was a hunter, an adventurer, a tough guy, one of those that's easy to admire. Whereas Jacob was loved more by his mother. Maybe it was because he was responsible. He stayed at home, took care of the family business. But who really needs a reason for sinful behavior? As it played out, Esau and uh, Isaac, or Isaac and Rebecca rather, showed their favorites very obviously. And I'm sure it, it had a bearing on these two boys and, and how they looked at life. Doting on the love that, that was shown to them specifically by these parents. Esau, for instance, probably encouraged by that that love that Esau showed, that admiration that Isaac showed him. Um, and he ran with it. He was an adventurer, a hunter. Didn't stick around in one place very long. Kind of followed life wherever he wanted it to be. Irresponsible. And he showed that he really didn't appreciate what was his. What his parents, or what God really, had given to him. And there's one account where... Esau, after a long hunting trip, comes back, he's famished, and he shows this. Jacob is cooking a stew, and, and Esau volunteers to trade him his entire inheritance, his birthright, just for a bowl of stew, showing how there's, there's no value on what was so easily given to him. Jacob, on the other hand, shows that he values what Esau has more than what he has. Now let me explain this, because this gets a little more deep. When Rebecca was carrying these twin boys, God came to her and said that the older would serve the younger. It would be the younger who would be the greater of the two. Which meant that Jacob, the younger of the two brothers, would get the inheritance, the birthright. It was twice the financial inheritance that the other brothers would get, or Esau would get. But it would also be that promise that the Savior would come through his family. A very special birthright. Now this was given by God, so it can't be revoked or rescinded or traded. And yet, Isaac and Rebekah felt this was in their hands. Isaac had decided that he was going to give this to Esau instead of Jacob. And Jacob wanted it, rather than simply trusting that God would give him what he promised. He and his mother Rebekah devised and schemed a way to, to steal this from Esau. You know, it's very underhanded. And I should say that the bad behavior of one family member doesn't justify the bad behavior of the others, but it's simply, it, it seems to promote it. And you see this family just conniving against one another, trying to get what's theirs. Well, Isaac is, is about ready to die, and so he says to Esau, go out and hunt and, and get me that deer the way you cook it, and when you come back, I will give you the birthright. Rebecca and Jacob see an opportunity. While he's gone, Rebecca encourages Jacob to dress up like Esau, to trick Isaac, who right now is becoming blind, to trick him into believing that he's Esau so that Isaac would give him the birthright. You can see under, how underhanded this is, but it worked. And Isaac gave Jacob the blessing, the promise that he would receive a double portion of the inheritance and that through him the Savior would come. Again, it's really not Isaac's to give, but here they show that they believe that this all rests upon them. And in this greed and in this dishonesty, they scheme and this 
blessing is given to Jacob. Now, Esau comes back and he's hot. He's angry because he has lost what he feels belonged to him. Something he didn't care about before, but now that it's been given to somebody else, he cares very deeply. And so he vows to do what in his mind is the natural action. He vows to kill Jacob, but not until Isaac dies. At least he has apparently that much of a heart. But now, now in, in an effort to save Jacob, rather than these two parents owning this, seeing this problem within their family, sitting down and fixing it, they kind of sweep it under the rug that Esau's going to kill Jacob, and they come, they come up with a different reason why Jacob has to leave. Rebecca suggests to Isaac that Jacob needs to find a wife, but not here, not in this area. He needs to find a wife back from their hometown of Haran. And so they agree to send Jacob off. Now Jacob, you know, how far has he fallen? He was one of the richest young men in this entire area. And now is shoved away from the family with nothing but a stick in his hand and clothes on his back. And he begins this journey, this hundreds of mile journey to Haran. And he gets about three days before this account that we're about to read. A three-day journey which, curiously enough, resembles that journey that Abraham took with his son Isaac after God told him to sacrifice Isaac. A three-day journey, about 70 miles, which would give him time to think. Think about what? How far he had fallen? How he had destroyed his life? How he could blame his family for what was going on, but he was the one who made these choices, and these are choices that can't be unmade. Very dark time for Jacob right now. But that's why this text is so beautiful. Why the light of God's love shines so brightly. And I want to read that to you now. It's taken from Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will be spread to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is God's word. And you know, it... I spent a lot of time talking about the dysfunctionality of this family, not with any joy or to simply point out the flaws of others, but it's good to own things. And when you recognize how bad things had gotten, it's what makes this so very special. You know, Jacob, how long, how long does it take to realize that your life is over, that you've done something to destroy it? After three days, Jacob realizes this. But that's when God shows up and says, maybe everybody else has left you. I have not. I will never leave you. Jacob is given this vision where he sees these angels ascending and descending into heaven. Ascending, as God has so regularly shared with his people, with his prayers. And, and God is, is listening and, and watching. And God's blessings are constantly descending from heaven to his children. And God is there watching and caring and loving. And he'll never leave. That's his promise. I will never leave you. I will give you these blessings and I will never leave until I have fulfilled your promises, my promises to you. Well, what were those promises? Promises of, of uh, prosperity, promises of a great nation. The greatest promise, eternity with him. Until that day, and he stands with God, God will never leave him. Beautiful promise. He who had lost everything, had lost nothing because his life was tied to God.
and God was not done with him. And my friends, th th there's a, an encouraging word here for you, I hope. I mean, I pray that you've never been in a position where you can look back on your life and see how you've ruined it. But if you are in the majority, we have looked back at our lives and seen times in which we have done things that have destroyed, or at least a small part of it. How long does it take to know that? Three days? Less? More? But when you find yourself in a position where you think that something you've done can never be undone, that you have destroyed your life, it's here where we see God speak to us and say, I, I will never leave you. It's not over. I will bless you. There's a beautiful passage here in Isaiah chapter 42 that I want to turn now to you, and Isaiah 43, where God speaks to Jacob and to Israel. But as, as Paul says, we who have the faith of Abraham, we are the true children of Abraham. I want you to know that, that he's speaking to you. And he says these words in Isaiah 43. Now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Just as God told Jacob, I will never leave you. He tells you, I will never leave you. There may be times when you think your life is over and you've ruined anything beyond any, any reconciliation. God says no. Because your life does not belong to you. Your life belongs to God and he's not done. He bought you at a tremendous price, at the, at the, the life of his son. And he will protect that investment. He will not let you go. And the blessings that he has planned for you and for me, we can't even begin to imagine. And sometimes God simply says, hang on. Just, just trust me and watch, and the blessings will unfold, because our life is in God's hands. As bad as things may get, it is never over, because we are connected to God. And remember this, because we are connected to God, we are connected to each other. You know, with Jacob, and spoiler alert, sorry, Minister Dan, um, God, he's even able to fix this relationship that Jacob has ruined with Esau but we'll see that next time. But know that we who are connected to God know God's forgiveness, and we're connected to one another, and so we are never alone. I hope you know that, and I hope you can find some comfort in that, to know that God has your future plan, and you are never alone. Amen. And now we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that you give us, uh, perhaps even more importantly, the blessings that you have prepared for us in the future, how you have shaped our future, how you hold us in your hands, how you see what is coming. Help us to rejoice in your love, in your protection, in your plan, so that we may rejoice every day as we live it with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, good day to you. There are a few announcements I'll remind you of. First of all, uh, we're done with the Easter lilies for our Sunday worship, and so if you have purchased one and would like to pick that up, please do so. You can pick it up this Sunday if you'd like as we gather together one at a time for communion, or give me a call, and I'll make sure that the church is open for you so that you can come get it. Today, or this Sunday, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper again between 9 and 1, so please show up, uh, wait in your cars, I will usher you in, and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper one family at a time. Uh, so please join us for this. And if you, you, know, if you need anything, uh, if there's some resources that you're looking for, some Bible studies, some devotionals, if you need, well, anything, or if you'd simply like to talk, please feel free to give me a call. The area code 859-361-0027. God be with you.